Welcome everyone, my name is Dr. Sam Shea. Today is a masterclass on functional lab testing for the liver and the gallbladder. I'm a chiropractor and a certified practitioner for the Institute for Functional Medicine, as well as a certified practitioner for the Kalish Institute for Functional Medicine, and the author of two ebooks, uh, Your Missing Genes and Biohack Your Biohacking, both of which are available for free at my website. The very first lab test we're going to talk about is actually not liver testing per se, it's actually gut testing because there are some key liver markers in the gut test. Now we're going to get to liver testing in a moment, but I wanted to start with the gut. One, because a lot of practitioners in functional medicine do start with the gut for many good reasons. and. There are four major legitimate functional gut tests that are used by the vast, vast, vast majority of functional medicine practitioners. One is called the GI map uh, by um, Diagnostic Solutions Lab, GIFX by Genova, CDSA, there's multiple different companies that run a CDSA, and then GI360. They all have their pluses and minuses, their uses uh, for different situations, but I'm gonna be speaking primarily about the GI map um, it's a very, very effective and popular test for many good reasons. It's, it's very straightforward. Uh, it's a one-day sample, and it captures all sorts of things, um, in, like lots of infections and also digestive markers. And, and I just want to point out that you don't need to do a GI map to, get a stool to do a stool test that will check on things for your liver and gallbladder health, because all of these have a test that check for digestion and check for fat absorption. So in the GI map, it's called steatocrit. And in the other tests, they can call it a fat stain or a steatocrit. But just know that any of these four uh, legitimate functional medicine tests for the gut will have a digestion marker to see how well you are actually absorbing fat, how well your gallbladder is functioning, how well you're able to take fat that you eat and actually break it down to a point where the enzymes can work on them from the pancreas. And because if you have high levels of steatocrit, what happens is that you have fat in your stool. And what that means is that you're not absorbing fats and you're not absorbing fat soluble vitamins that your body and your liver need so desperately. So ste high steatocrit is a it's a marker checking for how well are you dealing with fat absorption. And I primarily first look at the gallbladder. I also would look at the pancreas if there's insufficient lipase from breaking it down. Other signs you'll see is maybe like green stool floating, um, uh, lots of flatulence, gas, diarrhea, et cetera. And we'll see markers later on in other functional tests called the ion panel, where you can actually see the effects of high steatocrit, I mean, high fat in the stool. I'm not talking about high fat in the blood. High fat in the stool means low fat in the blood, too low. You're not absorbing the right fat and fat soluble vitamins that your body needs. So that's the first marker off the stool test. The other marker is what's called beta glucuronidase. It's a kind of a mouthful. You could easily win a Scrabble tournament with all the terms that you see on these lab tests. And beta glucuronidase, uh, this is kind of the official write up from uh, the GI map uh, folks. It, it's an enzyme that's produced to help detox from, um, you know, uh, thiols, alcohols, etc. And what happens is that if the marker, if this marker is ramped up, and I've seen this marker in the 20,000s, what it means is that there's bad bacteria in your gut that are taking, you know, say like estrogen floats by in its detoxed form. It's got a little a group that was attached to it after phase one, phase two liver detox. It goes into the bile, it's ejected into the intestines, and then it's pooped out as it should. Problem is, is that if it's a bad bacteria, is kind of waiting in the bushes and it sees this detoxed estrogen floating by the intestines, it'll grab it and then use that estrogen to help itself grow, clip the detoxed little tag that was put on it and spit it back into the bloodstream. And the liver is like, wait a minute, I just saw you. What are you doing back here? And it creates this wind up. So if your liver, your liver can be stressed from dysbiosis in the gut. And so that's why I brought up gut testing. The second major test to look for to help your liver and gallbladder is what's called the ion panel. Uh, to me, it's the key liver nutrient test. Uh, there's other 
uh, there's there's other like knockoffs to this test. When I say knockoffs, I'm being technical because like there's something called the Nutraval, which is popular, and that was literally a knockoff of the ion panel. Uh, Nutraval was just kind of a, a cheaper, uh, in my opinion, not as useful version of the ion panel. Uh, but this this is the original test developed by Dr. Richard S. Lord. Uh, I learned all about this ion panel in my studies with Dr. Kalish at the Kalish Institute. And the ion panel does a lot. There's over 150 markers on it. It, to me, is the giant nutrient test. And the nutrients, uh, I mean, you can connect it to mitochondria. You can connect it to uh, gut. You can connect it to all sorts of things. We're going to talk about it in the context of the liver. And the ion panel also has some very key specific markers on liver health. Uh, specifically three different markers for glutathione and some other liver pathways as well. But I'm going to connect the dots here on why it's important that you do an ion panel to really check the health of your liver in the sense that does it have all the nutrients it needs in order to operate. So first off, there's the amino acids. Now, you need amino acids to detox. So for example, glycine is used as part of the um, detoxification pathway. Taurine is used as part of the detoxification pathway. You need all of these proteins, all these amino acids to build proteins. So if you're low in these essential amino acids, then what's going to happen is that your ability to repair, your ability to create the enzymes, create the nutrient, to create the, the processes you need, support the process you need to detox and and make all the molecules you need to help you keep yourself clean and healthy through your liver, that starts with the amino acids. So if you're seeing deficiency in the amino acids, then there's going to be problems in your liver. And, you know, you can't, the, the reason why I'm talking about amino acids first is that if you're really deficient in amino acids, then you really need to play catch up. So if someone was like really low in glycine, you know, like first quintile or lower. I mean, these this is these are quintile distributions. So this is like a bell curve. This is one edge of the bell curve. This is the other, and the bell curve goes over like this. And then this is the bottom two and a half percent of the population, and over this line is the upper two and a half percent of the population. So in the middle is the middle ninety-five percent. Well, if you're in the first quintile or L, means it's below. That you're really deficient in these amino acids. So this is where free-form amino acids are so important based on testing, and you need much higher doses than what you may think. So if someone was like first quintile here in glycine or lower, I'd be giving them three, six, maybe even more grams a day of these free-form amino acids. And some of you may be thinking, well, how can you give amino acids if someone's gut is messed up? Well, the benefit of free-form amino acids as opposed to things like collagen or or people getting proteins from diet, if they're, they have a therapeutic need and they're really deficient, you give the free-form amino acids because your gut doesn't need to be in good shape to absorb the free-form amino acids. The whole point of digestion of proteins is to break them down into free-form amino acids. That's the last stage of protein digestion, digestion actually in the colonocytes, the little cells that line the internal lining of the gut, to break them down into these individual amino acids. But if you just take free-form amino acids, your gut can be totally leaky, permeable, whatever, and they still go through, and then you can start repairing your body. Another thing I want to point out here is the urea cycle. Now, the urea cycle is, actually happens in the mitochondria, and uh, this is a detox pathway, your body's ability to clear ammonia. And this, the ion panel also checks for this pathway uh, because it is a detox pathway, even though it happens in all the cells that have mitochondria. So the other portions of the ion panel have something called homocysteine. Uh, we like to see this number under eight, ideally, and that is a really hazardous marker that creates a lot of damage in the blood vessels. It checks for markers, uh, minerals in the blood, um, and, and I'm abundantly aware that there's controversy over like how, you know, does low magnesium mean the low magnesium in erythrocytes means low magnesium in the tissues. I'm aware of that uh, argument and discussion. There are other markers on the ion panel that show functional uses or, or, or insufficiencies of magnesium. But in general, like, it's a good initial measure, uh, uh, idea of where things are at. Uh, the calcium number is not, it's more about 
lipid lipid fluidity than the actual calcium uh, your body uses. Uh, zinc, copper, selenium, all very important minerals for detox, and then some heavy metals as well. And then we come to the fat-soluble vitamins. Now, the fat-soluble vitamins are very critical because uh, the liver makes and uses fat-soluble vitamins for detoxification. There's another really important marker called the lipid peroxides. We're going to talk about this in a bit more detail. Lipid peroxides is the marker of how damaged your fats are in your blood. So I want you to pay attention to this is in the third quintile. So if it's in the third quintile, you think, oh, it's kind of normal, it's fine. It's actually not fine relative to where the rest of the fats are. And I'll show you what I mean in a second. The ion panel also checks something called 8-hydroxy-2-deoxyguanosine. Again, another Scrabble word. This is water-soluble free radical damage. So the liver... Uh, Liver is involved with a lot of detox and a lot of dealing with uh, free, free radicals, inflammation, uh, toxicity, of course. So this is another marker to indicate, do you need, like, say, lots more vitamin C uh, to help your body, help your liver also uh, stay healthy? It also checks for vitamin D. Now, going back to lipid peroxide, just notice here it's in the third quintile. But if you go here, now, by the way, this is off of one client of mine. Uh, this is part of the same test of his. So this is a third quintile, but you'll notice his essential fatty acids. These are the omega-3s, these are the omega-6s, and then he's got some polyunsaturated omega-9s and some monounsaturates. You see how on average, they're all really, really low, really, really low. So if his lipid peroxide marker is in the third quintile, but on average his fats are in the first quintile or even lower, that's really bad because proportionally he's deep frying like his these fats in his blood should be commensurate you know with the lipid peroxides or ideally lipid peroxides are less but it's actually inverted so when i did his stool test you'll see he has really high long chain fatty acids and high phospholipids and his stool was green so remember when i talked about the gut testing it's very important to do gut testing to check uh, for your liver, because if you're not absorbing fats, what happens? Well, look, he's not absorbing his essential fatty acids. And what's worse is what little fatty acids he does has are getting uh, microwaved or, or de sorry, deep fried in his body. So the good news is I'll just a little case study here. Uh, 12 months later, his lipid peroxide stayed exactly the same from 1.28 to 1.28, but notice that the markers shifted up. See, you don't see all these lows here? The, these, these dots are actually over here. There's no more lows, and these things have creeped up on average. So that was 12 months, and what I did was that I focused on improving his digestion, particularly fat digestion. I added in really high-dose antioxidants, and I removed all supplemental oils, you know, oils you take as supplements. I just removed them because they're getting deep fried until we can fix his digestion and fix his protection of his fats. Then eight months later, we ran it again, and you can see how his lipid peroxides shifted down slightly to 1.27, not much, but you'll see his fats changed from that second test to now they're basically lining up. So now he's able to add in all the, he's he's able to add in all the supplemental oils or sorry he added those in for the second round he was still on fat support fat digestion support and high antioxidants and we added in uh, before the third test these supplemental oils and you see he's basically normalized. Here's another example of a client that was extremely deficient in fatty acids as well as the fat soluble vitamins and really high lipid peroxides, as well as water-soluble free radicals and low vitamin D. So I'm still working with her, but this, this, is, this is what you can find in an ion panel when someone is not absorbing fats correctly and whatever fats they do have are being terribly damaged because they don't have enough fat-soluble vitamins. Now, because the fat-soluble vitamins protect the fat from being from developing peroxides, being uh, developing free radical damage. Next, we have the mitochondria. Now, how are the mitochondria related to the liver? So mitochondria are the powerhouses, the factories of 
the cells, including the liver cells. You need electricity to run the cells. You need electricity to run the liver, to run the gallbladder. So you need to know the state of your mitochondria, your electricity factories, in order to know and understand the health of your liver and gallbladder. And there's three main patterns. I, I, again, this is, not a, this is not an interpretation class. This is an overview class. But just to give you some ideas of the bigger patterns to look for, if the patterns, if, they're all, if there's a pattern of high, that means the engine is running hot and it needs more fuel, more oil, and more nutrients. You know, it, it needs the fuel in order to drive the machinery. But if the pattern is all low, this is a new phenomenon in the literature in the past 10 or so years called mitochondrial retraction. So the engine has melted. So the protocol to help a mitochondria that's running too hot is different from trying to rebuild a mitochondria from scratch. And then the third pattern is if mostly it's pretty good. It's all mostly in the second, third, and fourth quintile, and you got a couple outliers, then you just need to give one or those specific nutrients that are in the outliers. Then you have the organic acids. I'm skipping over a couple markers, uh, just kind of getting to the more salient markers related to the liver. I mean, there's over 150 markers on this ion panel. So I'm just going to the ones that are most relevant to the liver. So we can jump straight down to the actual liver markers themselves. Now, these are not the standard liver tests you would see when you go to your PCP, MD, GP, whatever. You know, this isn't GGT, ALT, et cetera. You can get those as an add-on to the ion panel. That's called the serum blood chemistries. But what these are, are the functional liver tests. So 2-methylhipparate is a marker for chemical exposure. It's looking for xylene. And, and it's the reason why Dr. Lord picked xylene is because where you find xylene, you find all the other chemicals mostly. So he just wanted one canary in the coal mine. He wanted to find a marker for xylene. So if someone was really high up here, that means they're being exposed to it and they don't have enough glycine to deal with it. Orotate is a marker of the urea cycle that we mentioned up before. Glucurate is a marker for your ability to detox medications. And down here is an example of someone who, uh, after receiving a whole bunch of antibiotics, uh, got incredibly sick, massive chronic fatigue. You'll notice his glucurate marker was over double the upper limit here. So his dot is like way out over here somewhere. And what I believe happened is that he has a genetic variant in his glucurate pathway and he wasn't able to handle the medications. And the medications, when we look them up, are known to cause uh, chronic fatigue syndrome in certain individuals. So this, this person, he, had a, he was on an anti-hepatitis drug, and it just knocked him out. And then we have these three markers, 33, 34, and 35. There's multiple patterns to how these, um, th these are all glutathione markers, these three. And they can be in different patterns, like 33 can be high while the others can be normal, 34 can be high, and sulfate can be high, and, like, and then there can be, this can be low, and that can be high. But the worst... The worst of all is when sulfate is low. Dr. Lord, again, the PhD who invented this, uh, he was the, you know, the brains behind, the, the clinical brains behind the Metametrics Labs before it was bought out by Genova. Um, he said that sulfate is the single most important marker on the entire lab. I'll say that again. This is the single most important marker on the entire lab because sulfate is the marker, the strongest marker for glutathione status. So if you have a low sulfate marker, that means you are really in trouble when it comes to making glutathione. So things that people need are like glycine, and acetylcysteine glutamine, uh, B vitamins, magnesium, like the, all the things that are helpful in making, the glut making glutathione. Uh, there, there's lots of nutrients that are involved, but the main, main ones uh, you look for, I look for the amino acids, especially N acetylcysteine uh, glycine, and glutamine. So... One thing, though, about the pyroglutamate marker is that uh, th this is the only marker that is unreliable uh, in menstruating women because this is the one marker that changes more than one quintile on its own over the course of a month. And the reason we know this is Dr. Lord ran these profiles on people in his lab every other day for a month uh, and then collected all the data and he published the results and all the rest of it. 
and everything stayed within one quintile except for pyroglutamate and only for menstruating women. Um, so if this is, if we're testing a male or we're testing a, uh, a premenstrual female or a postmenopausal female, then the pyroglutamate marker is accurate. Otherwise we ignore it and we look at the other two. Then we come to uh, one of the last sections of the ion panel. And I'm looking particularly, uh, there's a couple of things I want to point out in regards to liver health. One is benzoate. So if benzoate is really high, and this one's 18.5, which means it's uh, almost double the upper limit of the fifth quintile, it can mean one of two things, or both. It can mean a really high need for glycine, or it can mean if, if both benzoate and hiparate are high, it can mean there's a radical dysbiosis and benzene's trying to you know, and benzoate is a uh, byproduct of the dysbiosis as opposed to just a failure of the glycination pathway. So if, uh, if benzoate is high but hiparate is low, then it's a glycine issue. If hiparate is high and benzene is low, then it's a dysbiosis. If benzoate is high and hiparate is high, it could be, it, it's a dysbiosis and possibly also a glycine issue. Uh, then we come down to uh, other markers to take note of. Tricarbolylate is a good marker for magnesium. Uh, D-lactate is an indication if there's a, uh, brain toxins being generated by dysbiosis. D-rabinitol, fungal marker. And Dr. Lord also said to not pay attention to the Clostridia species. Back when he designed the test many decades ago, uh, we weren't aware that there was uh, several, uh, you know, hundreds and hundreds, possibly, you know, a thousand or two types of Clostridia. Uh, most of those are commensal, so he says to ignore this marker 45. So those are the functional tests, the main functional tests uh, that I run when I look at uh, liver health, and, and it's gut testing and the ion panel. Then there's genetics. So genetics, there's a lot of genes associated with genetics, but there's a couple really key ones. Uh, there's, see, this is just an overview. Uh, Genetics, basically in the liver, there's two phases, phase one and phase two. Yes, there's considered a phase three as well in terms of repeating the cycle, but just for simplicity, uh, and I learned this metaphor from Dr. Kalish, uh, phase one is the washer, phase two is the dryer. And the way that it works is that you have dirty clothes. Okay, you have dirty clothes. If you put them in the washer, and then you put them, they're cleaned, and then you put them in the dryer, and they dry out, then they're better off than when they were before, when they were dirty, and you can use them again, they're great. Here's the problem. If you put clothes in the washer, but you never get them into the dryer, they get moldy and rot and are even worse than if you had never put them into the washer in the first place. And that is a very apt metaphor for what happens when you have an overzealous phase one, the washer, but a stuck, slow, clogged, or genetically challenged phase two. It means you've got all this dirty laundry that's going in and is being washed, 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 but there's not enough dryers or the dryers are broken or the dryers are missing components, nutrition, uh, or missing electricity like the mitochondria. They're not, they're not able to run. So you get the, these toxic compounds that were toxic before they went into phase one. They're not even worse after they've gone through phase one and can't go to phase two. So for example, uh, benzene, which is an aromatic hydrocarbon, is used a lot, you know, at gas stations to clean fuel off, but it's very dangerous. It can intercalate with your DNA. But what's even worse than benzene is benzene oxide. Benzene oxide is after benzene's gone through phase one, and it's a hundred times more dangerous than just benzene. So what happens is that it goes through phase one, and it gets this oxide radical. It's the wash in phase one, the washing stage. And then ideally what's supposed to happen immediately is it goes into a, one of the dryers and you have a sulfur group put on it or some other group put on it to neuter the damaging effects of the benzene. Then it's just put through the bile and then pooped out. So if someone genetically has problems where their phase one is overactive and then their phase two is underactive, meaning there's too much washing and too little drying, then people get into detoxification problems that are based in genetics. Now, the good news is, is that your genes do stay the same, but their expression can vary based on lifestyle, diet, nutrition, etc. This is epigenetics. So I made this traffic light here to make the point because they, to illustrate the point that when you look at genes, they're represented in red, yellow dots. And basically, if someone has a red dot, they start farther behind on the track as opposed to the green dot. But based on lifestyle, 
as you can see, someone has a really bad lifestyle, even though they have a green dot, they can careen into red-like behavior. And if you're a red dot in terms of your genes, you got a, you dealt a bad role, uh, genetic uh, the genetic lottery, you can, through lifestyle, diet, nutrition, etc., you can start to have the genes behave more green-like. The genes themselves will never change, but they act like a dimmer switch, so they can behave more like a green dot, even though you were given a red. So this is just one study out of Australia, uh, the, the May 2009, weighing it up obesity in Australia. They found that genetics contributed to 70% of someone's obesity, 70, 70. And through genetic analysis, I found that there are three genetic types of weight gainers. And this is relevant to the liver because in the, the liver is related to clearing out inflammation and clearing out hormonal toxic weight. So I found there are three major types of weight gainers based on genetics. Someone can be an inflammatory water weight gainer, one person can be a hormonal toxic weight gainer, and one person can be a caloric fat weight gainer. Now, here's the signs of inflammatory weight gain, the paradox of fat loss. Like, so you eat the tiny little muffin, and yet you gain one, two, three, four pounds in one day. Now, unless that muffin was last year's Christmas fruitcake that was regifted to you, that little muffin didn't weigh one, two, three, or four pounds. So what happened is that when you, you ate the muffin and the inflammatory chemicals and byproducts, gluten, whatever that was in that muffin, triggered an inflammation response in your whole body. And so your body retained water to dilute out the toxic inflammatory chemicals to do what? Buy the liver and the kidneys time to filter out the toxic inflammatory chemicals. Another ex example of someone who's got inflammatory weight the, some, for some people, like this is what I've lectured on at genetics conferences, the, the case studies on the more they exercise, the fatter they got. I mean, we'll talk about demoralizing. Let's talk about that. Why? Because they had such sensitive pro-inflammatory genes that when they exercise, they too quickly jumped over that threshold where exercise no longer was anti-inflammatory, but became pro-inflammatory. So the weight they put on was all water weight. Here's an example of an actual client. Uh, so this is the 15 most important inflammatory genes, and I break them up into initiating inflammation, sustaining inflammation, and, and clearing inflammation. And this person, unfortunately, has clusters of negative variants in initiating, over-sustaining, and under-clearing inflammation. So what happened is that she got a new uh, uh, trainer, uh, exercise trainer, without telling me, and this person was of the overzealous CrossFit type, basically overexercised her. And what happened is that she started gaining weight and losing muscle tone. And so she called me in a panic. It's like, what's going on? I'm exercising more than ever, but I'm gaining weight and losing muscle tone, and my cycle is off. Well, these are, this is also what happened, is that when we looked at her eight major liver genes, this is for phase one, this is for phase two, three for here, five for there. What happened is that her liver got overwhelmed with all the inflammation which meant that her liver had to make a decision. Do I deal with the inflammation that's dangerous right now? Or do I deal with the estrogen that's just in her body that's, that's not good to have build up, but it's not as bad as inflammation? Well, the answer is I'm gonna, the liver says I'm going to clear inflammation, particularly because she had a cluster here in the CRP genes. CRP genes are the genes that control the acute phase protein for inflammation in the liver. So she had a cluster of all three. Uh, so she got overwhelmed in her liver quite easily. And then she has problems clearing estrogen to begin with. She uh, over pushes estrogen into her phase two, and then her dryers here are too slow to deal with them and push them out. So what happened is that she got this massive buildup of estrogen dysregulation because of all the inflammation. That's why her cycles got all messed up. So... Uh, what I did with hers created a customized lifestyle diet nutrition plan based on the lifestyle recommendations based on the research of these genes that are uh, out of place. And she was able to, uh, and also have her stop the excessive exercise. That's some very strong words for that trainer. And pulled her back to only exercising two, at most three times a week with at least a day of rest in between with lots of walking and water. And then a massive amount of change to her uh, to her diet and supplement plan that was very heavy focused on anti-inflammation and liver supporting nutrients. So, and then her muscle tone came back and her cycle normalized. So 
Genetics is also a really, really important component of analyzing your liver. Uh, I don't quite know that many genes related to the gallbladder per se, but there's plenty associated with the liver. So if you want to know more, you can go to my website, uh, drsamshay.com. I have two free eBooks that you can just download there. One is on genetics. We learn all about the genetics uh, labs that, that are run for optimal health, including uh, you, you can learn more about how the liver detox stuff as well as how to genetically determine your ideal diet. And then an entire other eBook on the 10 pillars of health, of which biotoxins Right there is the fifth pillar, which is uh, very important to, uh, this is where liver health comes in, it's the fifth pillar right there. And it also goes over more lab testing. And if you want to chat with me at the time of this recording, uh, you can schedule here, just go to my website and you can schedule a free 15 minute health strategy call with me. And I look forward to helping you. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this talk on functional testing for the liver and gallbladder. Uh, I. Uh, I, I love teaching about labs, and the liver and gallbladder is such an important uh, organ system to really take care of. And I would highly, highly encourage everyone listening to, instead of just running out and buying some liver supplements or whatever, consider testing. Consider testing as the first step to discovering what it is exactly that you need to do to help your liver and gallbladder. Test. Don't guess. Thank you so much for watching.